It's Wednesday, February 26. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And breaking news just earlier this week, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, has ordered a California dam be completely drained so that effective repairs or rebuilding of the earth-filled dam at the Anderson Reservoir begin to take place. This project has been shanghai for over 10 years by local politics, so let's see if we can cut through all that and find out what is going on at Anderson Reservoir in Santa Clara Valley, California. Anderson Reservoir is located just south of San Jose and just east of Highway 101 in Santa Clara County, California, and is the largest of nine reservoirs, surface reservoirs, in the water district. This water district also gets water from the Central Valley Water Project. Up to 55% of their water comes from there. So this reservoir is only a portion or a part of the entire Santa Clara Valley watershed system. Anderson Reservoir was formed in 1950 when the Anderson Dam was built, damming up Coyote Creek with an earth-filled dam. There's an associated spillway off to the side and an outlet pipe running through the bottom of the dam. The dam itself is 235 feet high, 1,430 feet long, and 900 feet wide. The spillway elevation at Anderson is 627.8 feet, and the dam, of course, is above that. Being an earth-filled dam, what we learned in Oroville, of course, is you cannot, under any circumstances, ever overtop an earth-filled dam or it will fail. Here's a shot of the Anderson Dam over Coyote Creek, and here's the location of the spillway. It's basically an emergency spillway. There are no gates on the spillway. It simply flows when the water overtops 627.8 feet and that water flows around the dam and back into Coyote Creek. The normal water control outlet for this dam is this pipe coming through the bottom of the dam that feeds into Coyote Creek. And like most dams and reservoirs in California, it's located along some fault lines. The dam itself is located right on top of the small Coyote fault line, and just to the east of the dam is the Calaveras fault, and well to the west is the San Andreas fault. One of the many things we learned on this channel during the rebuild of the Oroville Spillway is that when you build a pertinent structures and or basic dams, you have to get that construction all the way down to bedrock. That's called dental work, where you got to completely scour the bedrock before you begin a forming a foundation for either a dam or any a pertinent structure like a spillway. For, for a dam structure, part of the problem with the failure of the spillway at Oroville was the fact that it was some of it was built right on top of clay instead of down onto hard bedrock well here at, at the anderson reservoir several geotechnical reports dating all the way back to 2009 and the most recent geotech report from 2016 seems to indicate after drilling that the anderson dam was not initially built all the way down to solid bedrock that's a portion of the earth-filled dam at Anderson was built on top of loose clay or sand and gravel. The problem with having a dam built on top of sand or gravel in earthquake country is liquefaction. So we'll do a review of earthquakes 
and a quick review on liquefaction here. We'll get to that review in a minute, but in the meantime, these geotech reports dating all the way back to 2009 have forced operators of this reservoir to operate it at a much lower level. They've reduced the elevation of the reservoir considerably. But back in just as recently as 2017, when we were having all the problems at Oroville, operators were unable to completely control the reservoir elevation and the reservoir overtopped the spillway, the emergency spillway. That spillway has only been used 11 times during the reservoir's history. And that caused some flooding in the San Jose area. Flooding due to a number of different circumstances, just the inundation of water, the Operators were running the reservoir wide open as best they could with the one single outlet pipe running wide open for a month straight. Couldn't keep up with the rainfall over top in the spillway, water dumping into Coyote Creek. And because of a lack of cleaning, of keeping the, the drainage clean in the Coyote Creek area, flooding occurred. And of course, the inundation of water. Another problem we're having here in California with these flood areas and keeping them clear and clean is homelessness of all things. Homeless folks tend to migrate into these flooded areas, near urban areas, these flood control areas, and set up camp and all that debris and stuff from homelessness gets caught up in these flood plain areas and creates flooding. The debris in the flood zones, the lack of vegetation control in the flood zones, the lack of control over the water flowing into the flood zones and the heavy, heavy rains all add up to factors that cause local flooding. On the other side of this coin, the local water district is facing serious lawsuits from various environmental groups going all the way up to the Sierra Club to keep the Coyote Creek alive. To keep the Coyote, Coyote Creek was historically a salmon and steelhead run, though today it's pretty much a urban concrete creek that runs through downtown San Jose. And so environmental groups have been fighting for years against the water district to keep Coyote Creek alive and effectively prevent the water district from doing the improvements needed on the dam. Because in order to completely remove the dam and rebuild it, you're going to have to divert the water or shut the water off altogether. Coyote Creek is kept uh, alive year-round now because of the Anderson Dam. Without the dam in place, the water becomes seasonal into Coyote Creek and completely alters the ecosystem, which has grown up and developed over the last 70 years since the addition of the Anderson Dam. In order to try to expedite things and cut through the red tape, California Assembly Bill 3005 was drafted up here recently. But this most recent letter from FERC looks like it'll finally force this issue to get resolved. Here's what FERC says in their most recent letter to drain the reservoir, dated 20 February. We've received your January 28th 2020 submittal and other recent submittals regarding interim risk reduction measures for the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project. In that letter, you state that continuing to follow the current 592-foot reservoir restriction provides the best balance between earthquake protection, water supply, and environmental protection. Specifically, you state that continuing to operate the reservoir at this elevation protects downstream areas in the event of an earthquake and or significant precipitation, maintains existing emergency water supplies in the event of a system outage or drought, avoids the risk of landslides that are possible when the reservoir is lowered further, and maintains water for downstream environmental protection, including protection for steelhead and federally listed endangered species. As clearly outlined in our January 14, 2020 letter, we do not concur that the project reservoir restriction appropriately balances the competing issues at this project. It is unacceptable to maintain the reservoir at an elevation higher than necessary when it can be reduced, thereby re decreasing the risk to public safety and the large population downstream of Anderson Dam. Until full remediation is completed, the dam safety risk at this project is unacceptably high. Your actions to date do not demonstrate an appropriate sense of urgency regarding the interim conditions at the project. 
And so he goes on to state that he wants that water level reduced to 565 foot elevation immediately and the reservoir be completely drained by 1 October 2020. Besides the concern of environmental damage downstream from the dam, the Santa Clara Valley Water District is also arguing that by keeping some water in the reservoir, you are reducing the potential to damage the inlet structure or the outlet pipe that leads the water out of the dam in the event of an earthquake by keeping a surcharge of pressure against the face of the dam so that in the event of an earthquake that dam doesn't slough down and damage or break the inlet or outlet structure to the dam. Remember if you cannot, if you lose that one pipe that leads water out of the dam, you lose control of the, of the whole, whole reservoir. The only way to get water out of the reservoir besides pumping it, which is impractical for such a big reservoir, is to allow the reservoir to rise all the way up to the emergency spillway, which would result in an uncontrolled release of water via the emergency spillway. The water district is also arguing that if you drain the water all the way down to the dead pool to the bottom of the outlet pipe, the, the dirt around the outlet pipe will remain soaked while the rest of it dries and in the event of an earthquake that outlet pipe might easily collapse or get covered up or blocked off in the event of an earthquake. And now with the inlet blocked off and the water rising, it would be difficult to get in there and inspect the inlet structure to see what needs to be done to get it reopened. So fish versus people, risk versus reward, just like in the airline industry, why we constantly practice for the worst case scenario of V1 engine failure right as you rotate to take off. The dam industry has to look at the worst case scenario, in this case, an earthquake with a completely full reservoir in front of a 70 year old dam that's not built all the way down to solid bedrock. As a result of events up in Oroville over the last couple of years and the quick rebuilding of the Oroville spillway, dams and spillways all throughout California are getting retrofitted, studied, rebuilt. The infrastructure of California is slowly coming up to speed and this is a wider subject not only here in California but all across the country the problem with aging infrastructure. So I hope this gives you a little better understanding of what's going on at Anderson Reservoir in Santa Clara Valley California as we look a little bit beyond the headlines. Now if you want to stick around let's do that quick earthquake review that I promised earlier. I gotta clear off the table here first. Things are gonna get a little shaky. Earthquakes occur with the slipping of tectonic plates. Two plates start sliding against each other. They build up friction and then eventually they move. When the tectonic plates move suddenly like that, they send a series of waves up to the surface. The the first wave to hit the surface is the primary or compression wave and that's the wave that knocks you off your feet, kind of like this. Next after the primary wave is the shear wave which operates perpendicular to the uh, initial compression wave and it moves the surface like this. That's the wave that, that keeps you off of your feet. And then finally, both of those waves interact with the surface of the earth to give you a rolling wave. And this is the one that's of particular concern to dam engineers as this rolling wave. And you can see these rolling waves. I've witnessed them before in the 1970s when we had the earthquakes that were uh, centered near Oroville here in Grass Valley. I remember watching down the road and witnessing the rolling waves. You could see the undulations in the, ro in the road. I could see the telephone poles whipping back and forth with the undulations and it's these rolling waves that are the most destructive especially in areas of, of uh, no bedrock or sand and gravel. Sand and gravel with water nearby can get shaken up and lead to liquefaction basically quicksand and structures can easily get damaged in that event. 
There are plenty of great demonstrations of liquefaction on YouTube. I'll find a link and post it uh, here in the comment section below. Special shout out to Matt Keller of Media Affairs there for the Santa Clara Valley Water District for getting me all the links that I needed to put this story together so very quickly. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned. See you here. Where's the rain? Hadn't had a drop all month.